Good afternoon. My name is Bruce Gunther, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Portland Art Museum to today's program. This is an important fall for the Portland Art Museum. We are celebrating Portland institutions, Arlene and Harold Snitzer, and the Oregon Center for Photographic Arts, Blue Sky Gallery. It is a celebration that I have long planned to see happen, and the publications that accompany it are well worth reading and available now in the store. That's it. Um, this is the first program of the kickoff weekend. It features <coughs> two, two colleagues and friends who I am very fond of. And there will be a similar in dialogue about the role and the impact that Blue Sky Gallery has had on not only the Northwest photographic scene, but their place in the national and international scene as that program grew in prestige and vigor over the years. Um, on November 5th, the museum will also host another dialogue between um, collector Arlene Schnitzer and uh, the director of the museum, Brian Friso. I encourage you to come to hear another perspective on um, how the, poor, the scene has evolved here in Portland. Many of us have come to Portland from other places uh, some of us have been here for 40 years, um, but it is a different place and a different time, and these exhibitions celebrate that transition and that evolution in a very important way. Um, Dr. Julia Dolan, familiar to many of you, received her PhD at Boston University. She's worked at a number of museums in photography, including um, the Distinguished Photography Department at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Since she joined the Portland Art Museum, she has brought to the stage some 20 exhibitions and permanent collection installations in our galleries. I would characterize them as thoughtful and witty. She, her ability to select images that I didn't say funny, I said <laughs> They show a great intellectual wit to see both the subject, the, the medium, and the way it's been used, and the connectivity between photographers and ideas. And so a visit to our galleries on the, on the 2M mezzanine of the Jubit Center are always valuable and always something you come away chewing a new idea a new revelation that she brings to those installations. Most recently, she has done two exhibitions that showcase important individuals in the world of 20th century photography. Robert Adams, a resident of Oregon, an uh, important conceptual photographer a, in a beautiful show of Oregon-based photographs. And then Gary Winogrand and Jonathan Brand, two photographers uh, loose on the streets of New York uh, Jonathan is now loose on the streets of Portland, and we <laughs> see him with his camera everywhere. And we are delighted with those shows, and they were important. Her colleague today and uh, discussant will be Chris Rauschenberg. Chris picked up a camera at the age of six, and due to a certain, I think, lax parenting, he kept <laughs> photographing because he had two artist parents and a stepfather who said, do this. He's a founding member of Blue Sky and a photo lucida in this community. As a photographer, he's been featured in over 211 exhibitions, one-person exhibitions, innumerable group shows. Those one-person shows have happened, as he's fond of saying, in 30 countries on five continents. In a, Antarctica weren't melting. <laughs> he would be there. Um, he's in the collection of 11 museums, including, I am happy to report, this museum with some beautiful and important work. In 2003, he was the first guy to get the Bonnie Bronson Award. As a fellow of the Bonnie Bronson, a prize that honors a, a member of this community who spearheaded the place of women and women in sculpture in this community, and, and it has celebrated participants who are performing at their highest level in our community. He is the president of the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, one of those lax parenters who let him photograph his way across the nation and the world. He, he serves our community. 
He energizes us with humor and play. Serious ideas about photography and about the place that it can have in this community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julia Dolan and Christopher Rauschenberg. Thank you so much. He makes us sound pretty good, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah it's kind of nice. Thanks for that, Bruce. Um, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about uh, this exhibition. It was important for me also today to have a conversation with Chris for all of you because I've been in this community for four years and Chris has been working with Blue Sky for going on 40 years, so I've been here for one-tenth of that, um, and I've been, in, I've been on this earth that whole time and very interested in photography <laughs> that entire, almost that entire time. Um, I think I picked up a camera maybe about two years after you did when you were a child. So, uh, so photography's been a love for me for almost the entire time that Blue Sky has been in existence. Uh, but it's so interesting, I think, to be able to play off of my different kind of critical distance about Blue Sky Gallery and then have one of the five founders here and sort of discuss how we interacted and, and how this exhibition came together and what I saw looking up from a bird's eye view, whereas Chris was on the ground this entire time working month after month after month after month for 40 years putting these exhibitions together. And I find the story of how Blue Sky uh, began like this, and this is the amazing um, Craig Hickman. Is Craig here? Is Craig here? He's not here. No. Um, who's one of the five founders of Blue Sky in the original space? And what was wonderful for me to, was, was to explore how Blue Sky went from this 40 years ago to this now. And this is a living institution. We're not. Uh, giving a 40-year history of something that no longer exists, this will continue on in space and in time and in the art world, which is incredibly exciting because when Blue Sky was established, there was no concept of 40 years later or what they would be doing in four decades. So I think that's very, very exciting. Yeah, uh, let me, let me yes. just cut in a second. When people, as last night, a number of people said, so did you imagine that you would be blah, blah, blah? And I said, well, to answer your question, let me just say that we didn't used to put the year on the poster. <laughs> so that kind of yes. gives you an idea. And, and as, as we were about to talk about how we went from that freight elevator sized gallery into this thing, I, I need to uh, say that we're actually celebrating not just two institutions, not just Harold and Arlene and Blue Sky this, this month and this week. We're also celebrating a third one, which is Bruce Gunther, who has been here for 14 years and done amazing things for the whole community, but especially for Blue Sky, too. We had, between uh, Bruce Gunther and Jim Winkler, we, we find ourselves with the uh, Blue Sky collection in the museum with, uh, it's, getting, it's getting to be close to a million dollars worth of uh, prints that have come into the museum because of that. And we find ourselves in this beautiful space, which was Bruce and Jim's idea. Um, and, uh, and also in the between there, we lived for 20 years in a very um, underpriced <laughs> place that Al Solheim was our landlord for 20 years and charged us very little money. And if we were a few months late, yeah, don't worry about it. So th th that's, that's three people I want to call out and say that's a large part of how we got this far. And then one of the thing is, would the, would the people who are current or past members of the Blue Sky Exhibition Committee Stand up or just for a second here. Oh, wow. So I, I just wanted to do that because I'm here representing them and I'm answering questions for them, but I'm not doing all this. All of those people and a lot more are, are actually doing everything. So. Thank anyway, you. Back, back to your train of thought. Yes. We, we got a couple trains going, it'll be good. Uh, we do, it's good. Uh, so one of the things I did uh, in order to thank a few other people as well, is a lot of thankfulness going on today. Uh, it's a very grateful town and a grateful museum. Um, what, as I was doing my research for this exhibition and uh, speaking of Bruce, when I arrived here, and this is very normal, when you arrive at a museum, uh, your chief curator or your director will say, in a few years, you will be doing X, Y, or Z. 
and that's not abnormal at all. And Bruce said, in a few years, you are going to be doing um, an overview of Blue Sky Gallery's 40 years. And I thought, oh, wow, how, <laughs> how do you do that? 750 shows, 650 artists. So I've had some time to think about it, which is good. Uh, and I've been working on it for a couple of years. And the research is so much fun. Uh, it's one of my most favorite things to do. And I did find this wonderful article. Do you want to talk a little bit about your 20th anniversary show? Because you and I have never talked about that, but I found out about the 20th anniversary. <laughs> So we, when, when Blue Sky was getting to be 20 years old, we, had, we decided that we would try to do a show kind of celebrating all the artists that we'd shown that we could still find in our first 20 years. And we thought, well, gee, we would need a pretty big space for that. Maybe we could do it at the museum. No, no, the museum will have to be, you know, in three years we'll do that. We'd be 23 by then. So, uh, so we, we basically went to all the art galleries in the city and said, we want to do a great big show. Will you take part of it? And they all said yes. And so we ended up with no budget and very little staff time putting together a show of, what was it, something like 90 artists, with, uh, you know, some huge, I mean, it was, it was this amazing thing. And it was all over the city. And the, the galleries, the only thing they said is, can we do it in January? We can't ever sell anything in January anyway. <laughs> But I mean, the, all the galleries pitched in and paid the shipping and you know did all the work. So. And I can help you with the numbers because this is what I found. So it, apparently, it's near one of the ends. 800 photos by 160 artists on the walls of 24 local galleries. But what I love about this article in the Oregonian that I found uh, by Randy Gregg, who's a wonderful um, arts writer and architecture writer, um, the very first line, the quote is, from you, no museum could do this show. It had cost thousands. And he's right. It does. And so add a couple hundred for inflation. Um, <laughs> so that is my kind of way of saying thank you so much to all our sponsors, because we could not have done this show without you. So we really appreciate all the support uh, that you have given us. And I also want to thank the 650 photographers uh, who participated in this. It was, it's a real group effort. Um, and of course, the founders as well. And I think, so Chris is one of the founders. There's also Anne DeFrank. Um, and Hughes is not here today. Robert DeFranco, I think I saw you. Yep. Can you stand up for just a second? He was there at the beginning. Robert, welcome. Um, and then uh, the beloved Terry Totemeyer uh, as well, who sadly passed away in, in 2008. And there's a wonderful, wonderful interview in the Blue Sky catalog between the four surviving founders that if you're interested, I hope you, you purchase the catalog because it's so fun to think about. Uh, the way that they did things. Something that I love about this uh, article is also the title. It's Picture Democracy. And I think that's a really important thing that uh, was espoused and continues to be espoused at Blue Sky Gallery is, you know, what is a photograph and can't we display it all? And over the past 40 years, they really have. This is an example. Uh, this is a postcard show from, I believe, 1983. Uh, I believe He's going to be. Um, and what I love about it is Blue Sky has shown Robert Frank, Harry Callahan, very classic, Paul Strand, people, the, the large names in photography. But there's also this incredible interest in the ephemeral and the way that photography is transmitted throughout the world, whether it's on a gallery wall or through the mail. Um, and, and you continue that to this day, which I think is really special about Blue Sky. Yeah, I think it's true. I think, I think we, um, uh, our, our show that was sort of the most fun like that was the photo booth show. We, ha we actually got a photo booth in the gallery, and uh, we had it there for, I think, three months. And I was the one who had to change the chemistry, so that was kind of fun. Um, but we had, we had one wall that was um, maybe eight foot square that had 500 photo booth strips on it. So we had 2,000 pictures on an eight foot square wall. I, I think that was, that was one of our more democratic efforts. We had more artists in that show than you could imagine. But. And I love that you and I have spoken about this, that when you and your cohorts established Blue Sky Gallery, you were doing it because you felt this incredible need. Yeah, although it's interesting. We, we felt this incredible need to see photography um, but I should say that the Camwork Gallery, Good Samaritan Hospital, was already going, and Mr. Pick's camera store in Oregon City, the Shad, Shad Williams had the Shadow Gallery. 
So we actually did run around and see some photography, but it just wasn't enough for us. We were greedy. And, and it worked out very well. But I, I love sort of the passion when you and I have spoken about this, about how, and Robert is the same way, that you wanted to see more photographs. You wanted to see what you, your peers were doing, and you wanted to see it on a regular basis. And it's, it's hard to think back to the 1970s or the 1960s even, even into the 1980s to a certain extent. But we need to look at it in 20th century eyes that photography was not necessarily welcome at the fine art table at that time. So you would not necessarily see photography exhibitions at museums. The National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. didn't even establish a program in photography until, I believe, 1989 or 1990. I'm very happy to say that the Portland Art Museum has been showing photographs since 1905, since the original building, uh, which is amazing. And by the 1970s, we're showing photography exhibitions anywhere from two to four times a year. And then Terry Totemeyer was installed as the first curator of photography here in 1985. Uh, so we're very proud of that. We now have a collection of over 7,000 works um, and a dedicated space to photography. But in the 1970s, you were not seeing that. There were very few places in the United States where you could go at any given time and see a photograph. And they were hard to sell. Oh, yeah. There was almost no market. Yeah, I mean, when we started the gallery, one of the things that, that we did is we sort of looked each other in the eye and said, we're just going to assume that we're never going to sell a single picture in the history of our gallery. <laughs> not, not that we thought the history of our gallery is going to be this long, but <laughs> we just sort of said, we're, that's not going to be a consideration at all. We're just going to show whatever we're excited by. And, and we were right to assume we wouldn't sell anything. We hardly have. But, but the work is for sale, so go to Blue Sky and buy something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then donate it to us. Yeah. <laughs> but I should say that if if I sort of think back into the 70s, there were basically uh, three photography magazines. There was Aperture Magazine, which has a huge Portland connection, um, and Creative Camera and Camera Magazine, the British and Swiss magazine. And every young photographer in the 70s would know everything that came out in those magazines. And nowadays, it seems like there's about 10 photography books a day that come out. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. Tom Champion is actually about to build me some more bookshelves for my photo books. But um, at that time, there were maybe 10 photo books a year that came out. And they were generally a, a master photographer having his life's work in a book. And uh, there were a few, just a few photographers who were starting to sort of say, well, I did this project, and I'm doing a book of it was Les Crims, did three strange little boxes of the incredible case of the Stackowitz murders, Little People of America, and uh, the Deer Slayers. And it, and it was so strange. And, and you had Ralph Gibson doing his first books. And there was a Dwayne Michaels book that we were very excited about. But I mean, there was, there was hardly any books that were by photographers that you could consider to be your peers if you were a young photographer. So I think uh, when we started our gallery, we thought it would be uh, like a local gallery for maybe just Oregon and Washington. And almost immediately, we were getting submissions from all over the country. Um, and, uh, and that has to do with what Julia's saying. There just weren't that many galleries. And uh, if you were in Phoenix, Arizona, you would, you would want to have a show here because you'd want to have a show in all six galleries in the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that brings me to these two examples of your poster program that I show here. Blue Sky was known very quickly throughout the country because of this wonderfully active promotion of the space through these beautiful posters. Yeah, Anne Hughes, who's the, the mother of Blue Sky. Blue Sky has one mother and four fathers. Um, and uh, Anne is a, is a terrific graphic designer. She's not very computery, so she's out of the design business now. But um, it's a, uh, uh, it's really our, our national reputation comes from Anne's posters. There's no question about it. The, the posters were almost as big as the gallery. I mean, you saw that picture of the original gallery, right? This is a 16 by 20 poster. The gallery was made, I don't think the gallery was 16 by 20 feet. It wasn't. It was uh, 12, I think, by maybe 16 feet. Glorified freight elevator, yeah. which is It was actually an idea that we didn't think of in time. but. I was thinking, had I thought of it in time, I would have tried to talk the museum into making a replica of Blue Sky inside the elevator. Because <laughs> the elevator here in this museum is actually bigger than Blue Sky. Yeah. 
but I didn't think fast enough on that. But <laughs> Next time. It, but actually, both years. of these posters have a funny thing, which is the, the first poster, this Blue Sky poster, which is the poster of our first show, um, was held up because we ha couldn't agree on the name of the gallery. We felt like it was really important, that the name was so important, we had to all agree on it. And of course, the name isn't important at all. You immediately forget about it, but we didn't know that yet. Um, and, uh, and so we went, into, uh, we went into the tavern across the street from the gallery and went into binding inebriation until we agreed. We kept drinking beer until we agreed on a name. Um, and the name was Blue Sky, and it served us well. But so then we could finally put the poster out. We could finally open the gallery. We had, the gallery was all ready to go, but we didn't have a name for it, so we couldn't send out the poster of publicity. And then the Joel Sternfeld poster, which later was, uh, was a show. Joel Sternfeld was a little baby photographer, just had his first show, which was in New York, so he wasn't such a baby photographer. Maybe, you know, but he was not yet well known. And uh, I saw the show, and there was a checklist of the exhibition. I marked which ones we wanted, including six that we absolutely had to have, or seven that we had to have. And we contacted Daniel Wolf Gallery, said, oh, yeah, we'll send you the work. And uh, here's the list of what we're sending you. And they had all but one of the ones that I had put a star next to, must have. So I kind of called him up and said, that's, yeah, that's good. That'll be a great show. But I did want to have this picture, picture number 47. or what? I had no idea what it was, but I just thought I had marked it. I was thinking of putting that on the poster. I said, oh, that would make a great poster. Oh, yeah, we'll get one of those for you, too. And then I, at this point, I was actually designing the posters. And so, and I was in Europe at the crucial moment, so I designed a poster with just a rectangle in it. And I said, you know, when the picture arrives, put it in there. So. <laughs> Worked out. <laughs> Worked out. <laughs> so um, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, there are 25 posters in the stairwell that connects uh, the Schnitzer exhibition with the blue sky. So you can see beautiful examples of them and, and how they changed and, and morphed over time. Um, and I wanted to show this. This was really exciting for me. I was at a conference of photography curators and historians of uh, photography at, uh, in Rochester, New York this past weekend, so a week ago. And the second session, we were at first at George Eastman House, and the second session we were at the Visual Studies Workshop, which was established in 1969 by Nathan Lyons, who's um, one of his photographs, um, diptychs, is, is in the exhibition. Uh, so they were off in Rochester, very similar to Blue Sky, except they also have an educational program. But they started because photography and the media arts were not as well respected as the quote unquote fine arts at that time. And so they are still here today. So they are 45 years later. But somebody handed me the Blue Sky um, archival file. And so I was able to go through this file in Rochester, and they saved all sorts of things that Blue Sky had sent them over the years. So you can see some examples here. And Chris, you can talk about maybe the, the reason that you sure. went, one of the reasons you went nonprofit so yeah. early. Yeah, the posters, at, at that time, nonprofit postage was hugely different in price from regular bulk mail. So that was the reason we had to have it. We didn't think anybody was actually ever going to give us any money or anything. Um, but you, this is, this is actually a show that Terry put together for us, a 19th century American photography poster. And, and one of the ways that we sort of saw the gallery was like this sort of launching pad for anybody's enthusiasm. So Terry said, I want to do this. And we all said, OK, great. There was, it wasn't like, well, we got to vote on it or anything. It was like, let's just do it. And you'll, you'll notice that the, uh, that the mailing label here is uh, handwritten. You'll notice that the, the uh, I, I don't know if any of you remember the Atlas adjustable rubber stamp that you had sort of loose rubber type you put in. We, each, each piece of mail that went out, we had a mailing list of 1,000 people, had three stamps on it because that adjust, the adjustable one only had three lines. So we had the address was one stamp, and then the first half of the nonprofit mailing was another stamp. And then we had to change the type and, and hit it again because <laughs> it had to be four lines. And of course, they were all folded by hand, all the posters. And, and actually, it's nice. A couple of the posters hanging in the hall are folded. At least yes. one of them is. Yeah, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so um, unfold it and put it up in the museum. Yeah, I think Tom Champions, I think yours may have been folded. Yeah, that's one of the few. And then a couple <laughs> of them. Yeah, so there's, they've, they've moved around from place to place, which is great. But this is how people learned about Blue Sky. Yeah. And here's another example. I found this also in the file. I love this. So um, Donna Mitchell wrote this for Blue Sky. And I love, you've, at this point, you've already changed locations because you've scratched out the Northwest Love <laughs> Now you're at North. But After Image is the publication of the Visual Studies Workshop, which is still in publication now. And apparently, they did some type of piece on these 
posters, and it sounds like you may have gotten overrun with requests for posters because she says, can you please maybe make another announcement in After Image letting people know that if they just send us their address, we will email them these posters. Uh, but it's not you know, something that we, you end up on our mailing list, it's part of our mailing list, which I think is wonderful. And it ended in about 1995, so you did about 20 years worth or so of, of the posters. Yeah, I mean, at that point we'd sent people out a, you know, couple hundred posters and we, I, we got to the point where we, first we were just doing nine shows a year and so we sent out nine posters a year I mean, nine shows and then when we we lost our original space on 23rd and Lovejoy that we were paying forty dollars a month for storefront not a bad location um, and we moved in there was a building that had the Northwest Artist Workshop and Portland Center for the Visual Arts were in the same building and we moved in with the Northwest Artist Workshop um, and uh, uh, we had, and then we moved upstairs, and then we got our, our space from Al Solheim, so that, that's our sort of moving history. But um, we had a, uh, uh, no, this is what, I, I might, my, lost my train of thought on that. What, what were you asking me? Oh, oh the posters. So, it's 1995. Yeah. so, so a after we moved into the second floor space, we just, we hated it that there was so much work that we were having to reject because we, we could only do, you know this limited number of shows. So we decided, well, we don't need such a big office. And we made our office be about the size of this little corner that Julie and I are sitting in, and we made a second exhibition space. At that point, we were sending out, uh, we were doing twice as many shows, and uh, we were doing 18 shows a year, and we just left the second shows off the posters for a while. And then we felt bad about that. So then we started putting them kind of half of the poster on the back, so there was a main show on the front of the poster and a secondary show on the back. And, and then we got to a point where we couldn't tell which one was the secondary show, but you couldn't have both of them full-size posters, or you'd have to put the, the poster in a bag, and that would cost another 12 cents that we didn't have. So, uh, so we decided that we could take these, if you had four months' worth of posters, and just made a book that was four sheets of paper <laughs> stapled into a little booklet. Then, then you could have eight shows in it, and, and everybody was a first-class show. And we decided, well, how many? You have 200 posters. How many are you going to put up? If you, if you haven't already put up ones that you're not willing to take down <laughs> out of the first 200, maybe you don't need any more. So. Collector's items now. So we have uh, a pretty good run of them in our uh, archive in the library. And I show this because uh, the posters were incredibly effective. And Robert Frank learned about you through them, did he not? Yeah. So Robert Frank, who hope, um, hopefully most of you know, and if you don't, please look him up. He's uh, 90 this year. And there was photography before Robert's Frank book, The Americans, and photography after it. And in 1981, he came and showed his work. So this is a photograph of him with, with Robert DeFranco talking. Came out to Portland, gave a talk, and then also uh, showed his movie, Cocksucker Blues, uh, about the Rolling Stones, that he has to be present to show because of copyright issues. Yeah, the, Stone, the Stones didn't like the movie because it made them look uh, degenerate. <laughs> uh, He's a documentary guy. Yeah. Um, but, but they did recognize that as an artist, he should, it's his work and he should be able to show it. But they sort of said, you can't just show it as like a movie. You, it's, if you're there and you're talking about your work. So we had his show and then there was a whole series of his films here in this, the, in this yeah, room. <laughs> Northwest Film Center uh, helped with that. So yeah. the, these, these were being shown here. So that's this wonderful connection. And I think that's what's so important about being able to look at all 40 years of what Blue Sky has done, because it's, it's easy to not recognize these incredibly impactful moments, uh, because there's so many of them that over time we try to keep them uh, you know, try to keep them alive and keep them moving. Yeah, um, and when we were still a little baby gallery, when we were still on 23rd and Lovejoy, so that's our first two years, um, we had, uh, one day we got in the mail from Robert Frank this letter and one of his negatives. And he said, oh, you guys are doing great. Here, make yourself some prints. And it completely freaked us out. <laughs> didn't, it, didn't it, Bob? <laughs> yeah, so it was like, here we are putter puttering around, doing this little thing that we think that that we're standing in Portland, Oregon, and we can see that nobody's very interested in. I mean, we have a few people coming in. I got to be great friends with Laurie Ross Paul because she came in and liked the show. It's like, whoa, I have to get to know you. You're the only one who came in here and liked the show. Um, but here we get this thing from the most important living photographer 
saying, I like what you're doing. Here's one of my negatives. Make yourself some prints. And Craig actually did make a couple of prints, but the rest of us were too freaked out. We didn't. <laughs> and then he made you send it back. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. He took it back. <laughs> I show this uh, image for a couple of reasons. I'm going to talk a little bit about why, and then I'm going to ask you a question about it that will lead to technological issues over time that you don't think about um, why certain photographers are shown at a place like Blue Sky, why some are not at a certain time, and why later on they might be. Um, what I love about this image, this is one of the earlier images. You, you showed Klaus's work, I think, in 1979, so within the first five years of the, of the gallery space. And I love it because it represents um, a lot of what you were showing at this time, this very um, beautiful black and white film photography, but you were also really excited about the world around you. And there were a lot of photographs that really exposed the grain structure of uh, black and white film, really hot highlights from flash and radical cropping, street type photography. There was a real excitement for the medium at that time, and I felt that way when I got my BFA and came out of college. I was so excited about the medium. It's just a really wonderful time in your career to be thinking about photography. Um, and things started to change and mature in some ways after this, but also what I love about this uh, photograph is this is the first European photographer you showed, and can you um, talk about how you met Klaus? Yeah, when, when, when uh, Craig and Anne were first sort of having this first conversation about what do we do, the people with the, the weaving studio moved out of the first two rooms of this three-room storefront that Anne's dark room was the third room of. Um, and uh, Anne sort of said we could put some pictures up. Craig said, yeah, it could be kind of a gallery. And Anne said, yeah, a gallery. Well, that would be nice, because then if a photographer came from out of town, Normally, we would just never know that. But if we had a gallery, they'd come to the gallery. We'd meet them. And that's what happened with Klaus Fromm. He's from Hamburg. And he and his girlfriend at the time, I, I don't know if they're still together, uh, they, they sort of wandered into the gallery. And, and he sort of said, oh, yeah, I have my work with me. So we went next door to the laundromat, because you saw that picture of our gallery. There's nowhere to look at work in that space. So he went and looked on the folding tables in the laundromat next door <laughs> at his work. And, uh, and he. Uh, his work was good. We said, oh, yeah, let's do a show of your work. Oh, and by the way, we're all going to the beach this weekend. Do you want to come with us to the beach? So he, he was an attendee of our first Blue Sky convention. <laughs> but it was at that time, I mean, if we had just seen his work in a book somewhere and, and wanted to show him, we, it would mean finding his phone number somehow, making a long distance call to Germany, and the person who answers the phone, maybe they speak English, maybe not. And we had a number of things where we tried to show, the, show somebody's work. We'd call up and we would say, you know, is so-and-so there? And we'd get some answer in the, that we don't understand at all in the language that we don't speak. And we would say the photographer's name again. And here would come some more words that we didn't know what they were. We didn't know if, if they were just saying, he'll be back in five minutes, or saying, I never heard of him. And we would hang up and we'd say, well, I guess we're not doing that show. <laughs> and but, in but, the 1980s. Yeah, well, fax machines came in. So you could, you could sort of fax somebody a letter. You still had to find their phone number somehow, which sort of sounds ridiculous now in this age of Google and computers and email and all this stuff. But it was really hard back then to, to do that. And now, I mean, our, it wasn't any limitation of our curiosity. I mean, our shows are about one-third international now, have been mm -hmm. for several years. And, uh, and there's plenty of great stuff going on everywhere. Sometimes it's too expensive to ship, so there's sometimes there's things we want to do that we can't do. Or, we're like the museum here, we're supported by membership money, and there isn't enough of it to do everything that we dream of, but. I just love, I loved finding out that the, uh, the fax machine changed your scope from national to international rather quickly, and I know you've shown uh, works by artists from over 30 countries now at this yeah. point, which is fantastic. The other technological thing that made our life much easier was the answering machine. <laughs> And any of you who were around before answering machines and you were trying to make a meeting, you had to make 30 phone calls to get yeah. a meeting together. I show these next because uh, these are also, we're still in the first decade, I gotta start moving us along into the next few. Uh, but I think these are really important and they signal something that I find so critical to the work that you do at Blue Sky Gallery. There's this absolute concern for the human condition, and I think that your committee tends to be drawn to socially concerned photography, and you start to see that occurring on a more regular basis as early as the first 
10 years, about the, toward the end of the first decade, there is a concern for the world around us and for the people who are living in it. And I think Jim Goldberg's work, which is um, having this wonderful reflowering at this time, his um, book, Rich and Poor, is being republished just this year. Um, and he's been written up in the New York Times and so on. Um, I think that you start to see the seeds of this within the first decade. Yeah, there's a, when I, I go to a lot of uh, portfolio reviews where people would sign up to show me work to try to get a show at our gallery, and, um, and they, they have a lot of people to choose from, and they have to try to match themselves up. So I always try to titrate by saying we don't, we don't generally show portraits and landscapes and these, some of these traditional kinds of work that don't have at least some component of talking about the world around them and, and sort of social issue. But it confuses everybody. I don't, and people don't show me work who, who I actually love their work. I have to hunt them down when I get there. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, Jim Goldberg's talk, he gave a talk at the gallery with his show. And his show was great. It was something that we had seen in a book. And we tracked him down and showed his work. And he came to give a, a talk. And so many people came for the talk that they were, they were, the gallery was completely full of people. And people were back down the stairs from the third floor down to the second floor, kind of going like this, trying to hear his talk. I don't think they could see the slides from down there either. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we had that in mind. We showed Martin Parr, who was one of was a very important uh, British photographer, probably the most important current British photographer. And we, we were afraid that we were going to have another Jim Goldberg thing where people were going down the stairs. So we did it here, and five people showed up. <laughs> so you, know, you, you never know. You win some, you lose some. <laughs> you never know. But, but Rich and Poor is great. It's been out of print forever, very influential, and in use, the, the way that it combines the pictures and the words. I mean, that's a good picture. But in, along with this word, you know, these words, me and Bobby have been together for two weeks, and we're still happy. Those words help paint a picture that that photograph can't do by itself. And, and that's really, it's, it's something that uh, uh, artists have been very interested in. How do you combine pictures and words? And, but and this it's was a, it's early real, for yeah. that. We're yeah. used to it now. This was early to do picture and word combination, in particular, allowing the subject to speak not just the photographer. And um, I show these two examples as well. We're getting into the second decade now, except um, Eileen Cowan on the left was in the first decade. Um, this is not your mother's Ansel Adams work, right? I mean, these are photographers who are getting into postmodernism. They're exploring issues of sexuality, of domesticity, and they're kind of turning these things on their heads. Eileen Cowan, incredibly important photographer um, that you showed her as early as you did is amazing. And then Nan Golden, many of you probably know The Ballad of Sexual Dependency, a really uh, tough but important book and slideshow. And some of the work had been shown a little bit in California at this time. It was kind of hot on the, uh, on the East Coast and in Europe. But people weren't seeing that work out here. And in, um, was it 1988? I think it was 1988, you showed 76 of the prints from the Ballad of Sexual Dependency, which is incredibly uh, good decision making on your part, <laughs> really. I, you know, to, Nan Golden was shown here that uh, when she was, she's still important now, but at the time, this was really cutting edge, difficult, unusual work. What does art mean? What does an art photograph look like? She's using Kodachrome film and she's printing from slides. What is she doing? I don't, do I want to see this woman beat up? Do I want to see her friends dying from AIDS? Like, what kind of art is this? What is photography doing? And you showed it. Yeah, I mean, she she would say that that she was photographing so that she could find out what she had been doing last night. <laughs> she couldn't remember. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we had that show. She her book came out, and I, I remember going into Powell's and sort of, oh, what's this book? And I opened it and I look at about five pictures. And I'm like, okay, I'm buying this book. <laughs> um, and uh, she was showing at that time with Castelli Graphics, uh, and I, I I knew the people there. Marvin, Marvin Heiferman was there. This went on to be an independent um, curator. And, and, uh, and so he told her, hey, this blue sky wants to show your work in Portland. She said, well, I don't want to show my work in Portland. He said, no, no, it's an important gallery. You should do it. So I mean, we were able to have that show because Marvin <laughs> told her to. <laughs> um, and Eileen Cowan, I got to say that she's, she was, I agree with you, she was a very important photographer and really good. She was doing this work the same time as Cindy Sherman, who you may have heard of. Um, and I think her work is, is closely aligned with what Cindy Sherman was doing, but better. 
and Cindy Sherman has gone on to be included in every show that has ever been done on photography, pretty much, other than this one. Um, and, and Eileen Cowan is largely forgotten, although there was a nice bunch of her work in the Pacific Standard Time show. I'd yeah. say, oh, good, you guys didn't forget. I think she's having a renaissance, which good. is great. And I'm so well excited. Deserved. As an art student in the late 80s, she was incredibly important to me, so I'm glad to see her again. Um, this is an example of a work that's in the show that is really different, and there's a reason why I chose this photograph. And there are reasons why certain photographs made it in and others didn't. And it would take me hours to tell you exactly why all of what happened did and what other things that didn't. Stephen Mark is a professor at um, Arizona State University. And what I think is so important about the imagery that he showed in, I believe, 1996 or 1997, um, is the fact that he is an early adopter of digital work and computer-aided imagery. And so again, to our eyes right now, wow, this is something that seems, quite frankly, dated. But I love the fact that Blue Sky at the time said, and there's still a divide today, which I find amazing in the 21st century, like, oh, analog's the only way to go, digital is a scourge on the, you know, the face of photography, if you will. Um, you, as an organization, were willing to take these risks and say, look at what people are doing with photography now. Computers are coming into our worlds, we're using them all the time, and people are starting to filter photographs digitally. And I think that's incredibly important for you to have done uh, in the 1990s. And what I love to do then is um, have a look at uh, Anu, Anu Matthews' work, and I'm sorry, I, um, Anu, I meant to put your third name in and I didn't, but oh. <laughs> uh, she's here there all the way from Rhode Island, which is fantastic. We have a number of our uh, artists in the show who came all the way from the East Coast. But I love looking back, uh, can I go back with this red arrow? Maybe not. I love seeing what 10 years has done to digital photography. And if we had said early on, digital photography, look out, can't, oh, it's, mm. can't touch it, it's not real photography, amazing objects like this would not happen. And just like Stephen Mark, um, Anu is thinking about, um, identity, particularly in the United States, but it's become completely seamless. She has taken characteristics of this 19, uh, 19th century image of Chief Redshirt, and she has moved them into her own image. And this really couldn't be done cleanly without the digital world, and it's so sophisticated. And what I also think about, too, um, is the way that there's a sense of, in some ways, Jim Goldberg in this even, like putting text onto images. and. Um, there's Eileen Cowan, because who am I as a woman, as a human being? And uh, Anu's work does this in many ways. So there's almost this wonderful buildup throughout Blue Sky's history and the history of more recent photography that manifests itself in somebody like Anu Matthews' work. And then you come to that conclusion and then you show the work in the gallery. Yeah, I mean, we were always interested. We, we were never sort of close-minded about uh, any kind of technological things or category. We didn't worry so much about categories. Uh, we, we did a show of snapshots. was one of our early shows that we did. Uh, we, uh, as I said, we did photo booth pictures. Uh, we had pictures. I think our final show in our original freight elevator location was uh, pictures from JPL of Mars. Uh, and uh, so it was just, you know, what, whatever people were doing, if it was cool, we wanted it. And uh, we did have on our, uh, in our founders group, Craig Hickman was an extremely early adapter of computer stuff, so we weren't scared right. of that. Craig, Craig made his own scanner with an IBM Selectric typewriter and an electric eye that he bought from Radio Shack. And he'd put the picture in and, and just keep hitting return. <laughs> so that, that'll tell you that we had some early, adopt, early adapters here. But, but it was a... Uh, uh, I mean, it was just always something that we were excited about. And uh, I think one of the things that uh, is true for all arts is that art is driven by curiosity. And if you have somebody who says, well, here's a new tool you could use, if you're driven by curiosity, that isn't a scary statement. That's, oh boy, kind of a statement. You know? <laughs> and we actually went, uh, there was a, a one point where we went a year and a half without a one person black and white exhibition. And it was right at the time when you suddenly, for the first time, could do color printing at home. You had this funny drum that you, you would be, could rotate, and every print you took out was a completely different color balance, but you could do it at home, you know? Um, 
gee, this is a little magenta, should I adjust it? No, I'll just make another one, see if it comes out greener this time. <laughs> but, uh, but, but we were also, at that particular moment, we got excited about doing a lot of group shows and stuff. So I think there's a, uh, I think there's a kind of a, uh, you know, when, when we would see something like this project of animals, we would just be blown away. We'd say, this is really great, it's so smart, it's, it's so wonderful. We didn't worry about, did she use a computer, and you know, it was, you know, it was just like, this, this changes my brain and the way I understand the world, and I wanna, I wanna infect you with it, too. <laughs> uh, here, uh, moving us along into the 21st century, and you, I've placed these on the screen. They look like they're the same size. You need to see the exhibition because these photographs are not the same size. Uh, and I think that's really important and something that I love about photography as printed or in a gallery space, because there is a lot of talk of, well, what is this gonna to do to museums? Everything's on, online and we transmit imagery that way. But artists make decisions about print size and scale and tone. So for I don't see that the print is necessarily going to go away. I think we will continue to adopt other uh, means of showing imagery in gallery spaces, but it's very important to be able to see the physical object, and you get high, high numbers of people coming in on first Thursdays to see the work. Um, I digress a little bit, but this is my way of saying, mm. don't trust the images up on the screen, you need to see them in person. Um, but I show these because something that I find so striking and so incredibly important about what Blue Sky has done in the 21st century is to find photographers who are capturing this unease that we have in this world now in a couple of different ways. And so these are two examples. We've got Bill McCullough who makes these wonderful photographs um, at weddings. This is like part of his job. He's a wedding photographer, but then he finds these odd, sometimes uncomfortable moments at the weddings, and which becomes his fine art photography. And then somebody like Danny Tracy, who uh, goes through uh, different kind of abandoned spaces in the woods near London or parks near London and in London and picks up discarded clothing and then makes suit, suits out of them and then wears them. And all these issues of identity come up and personality and, um, and it's a really uh, overpowering image. Um, there's a tension in photography and in the world now that I think you are very interested in exploring in this time, in this place, which I think is uh, special. A lot of, some of these photographs are not saleable, like the market doesn't quite know what to do with them, but you decide to show them because there's, there's a kernel of something that we are all perhaps feeling or experiencing. Yeah, I've, Bill McCullough, the, the wedding photographer, um, I saw his work for the first time at PhotoFest, which is this big, I, I alluded earlier to these portfolio reviews, this uh, 500 photographers coming to show their work to 200 uh, publishers and curators of photography. And this, this guy was there and he had some other work, I didn't even remember what it was, and he had just a few of these wedding pictures and everybody was just giving him this hard time, it's like, you came to PhotoFest with wedding pictures? Are you out of your mind? You know. And, uh, and by the time he showed them to me, it was like he wasn't sure he was gonna, I, but I always say, you gotta show me everything you have. And I was like, well, these are great. Never mind your other work. These wedding pictures are great. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and we ended up not only showing them, but it, both of these guys, we've actually just published books of. We have, in, in, uh, as part of our um, being excited about the show here at the museum, we accidentally published uh, 36 photography monographs by artists that we've shown, including these two. So if you go to uh, our website, blueskygallery.org and slash books, you'll, you'll see our, our books, which are very cheap. They're average 64 pages, $18. They're very affordable. But anyway, but then when we saw Danny Tracy's work, which is really interesting, strange work, and we, we just saw it reproduced. We didn't see the full scale thing and everything. I mean, he's a British photographer. They're mounted on aluminum, I think, or steel, I don't know. And, uh, and we just definitely wanted to do the show, but it was really expensive to ship them here. And, but we, we were so excited about it because um, it, has, it has so much sort of richness of meaning. I mean, he's not just making a suit of clothes, he's covering every square inch of his skin. I mean, we're hearing a lot about covering every square inch of your skin now because of the Ebola thing, but, but this is, when we talk about identity, his identity is completely hidden. We did a whole show of this guy's work of life-size self-portraits. I don't know if he's black or white. I, I mean, he's finding, he's finding stuff on the street 
taking it apart, putting it back together again, and completely disappearing into it. It's fascinating work. So, but anyway, we couldn't, we couldn't afford the show. We didn't have enough membership money. So we called uh, Bruce Gunther up and said, here's this great show we're gonna do, except that we can't do it because we don't have the money. Do you have somebody who could, you could find to buy a print for the museum? And then we could use that money that we make off that to ship the whole show over. And of course, Bruce stepped in, got it done. He did. And there it is up in the museum now. I love it. I've used it already before, so I'm happy <laughs> yeah. to be able to yeah. use it again. Yeah. Uh, and along that kind of same thread, I, um, I love that you rather consistently, and this again is from a bird's eye view, uh, you wouldn't see this from month to month, but there is a dedication to showing the work of individuals who are concerned, again, this kind of empathetic concern, um, with what is happening in the world and the number of conflicts that are occurring at this time. And not only people who are directly involved within the conflict, but the way that um, people in the United States or other places are affected by what's going on. So Sage Sawyer, Sage, are you here? I didn't see you earlier. She's here somewhere. Oh, there Hi, she is. there she is. Um, Over by Stu. Who came in from Boston. Uh, her wonderful work on the left, Boy in His Bedroom with Model of Kandahar, uh, Afghanistan. So he's playing war. As soon as we go into Afghanistan, he has already made a model of Kandahar and is, is playing his war games in his room. And then Natan Devere, who did this beautiful series called 18, um, he's an Israeli photographer who is, uh, was very interested in the way that the Arab population exists within the borders of Israel. And so when all uh, Israeli uh, youths at the age of 18 go into the army, there is about 20%, uh, I believe, of the population is Arab. And their 18-year-olds, of course, do not go into the Israeli army. So he followed these children and made these beautiful, wonderful portraits of them and, and what life is like for them. And that is something. He's actually very popular as a um, photojournalist. but. For, to be able to show him in an art space is wonderful too. And then I show you these two uh, wonderful images by Louis Pelou who has taken himself over into Afghanistan. He has embedded himself and has also worked independently and makes uh, amazing portraits of everyone. The soldiers as on each side, American soldiers, Canadian soldiers, also Afghan soldiers, and then individuals who are not soldiers but who are, who are completely impacted by living in this space, this uh, incredibly difficult uh, space. And I think, again, sometimes these are images that are not commercially viable, but you are making a statement through the beautiful, exceptional work of these individuals who are working really hard in dangerous places or in safer places, but thinking about these uh, concepts. Yeah, and let me just say that, I mean, the uh, Sage's picture of that, that boy in his childish pencil bed with this perfect model of Kandahar working on military strategy, which he was completely into. He wasn't, I mean, he was really into it, according to Sage. Um, but the whole, that whole project, Perfectible Worlds, was about after September 11th, a whole bunch of people sort of went, I, the big world is too, is too much for me. I can't deal with it. I, I need a small world that I can control. So it, that whole project was about sort of retreating back from like, I, that's, that's too much for me. Um, and it was a, it's a really interesting observation. I mean, I mean, it's interesting to see, to be embedded with the Canadian troops <laughs> through Louis Palou's eyes and stuff. But there are, other, there, are, there are very sort of rich and nuanced ways to look into these things that we're not going to get from the newspapers. We're not going to get from anywhere else. We're not going to get from the TV news. And so I think to have artists who are, as they do, looking at things from, uh, they're looking in through windows that nobody else is looking in through, and therefore seeing different parts of the, of the room <laughs> than you're going to see otherwise. And I think that there's a, uh, that's part of why we're, why we're so excited to show work that has these connections, that's about the real world around us. It's like, there's things that, that we are fascinated to find out about the world around us that we can only see through the eyes of the artist. Mm -hmm. And I wanna show this last slide because, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is, Blue Sky is gonna continue to keep on, which is wonderful. They own their space, they're doing incredible work. And so one of the reasons to have this show is to say this is what they've done in the past, but let's look into the future. And what uh, another thing that I love about the program is 
some photographers come back multiple times, I, and Sage's work is up now. So you can see Sage's photograph in this show, and then you can go to Blue Sky Gallery, which is just a 10 minute walk in, you know, up to the North Park blocks, and see a different series of her work. And she's been shown, what, five times at the gallery? So there's certain photographers who have repeat performances at Blue Sky. And then there are other photographers who are just out of school, and this is their first show or they've turned to photography later, or they've been working for 20 years and they finally are accepted. They, they've gotten a body of work together that is impactful and the committee says, we need to show this in Portland and it happens. So Blue Sky is continuing on and I really look forward to seeing what you all will be choosing to do in the oh, next Oh, we have some good years. stuff picked out. I we have the next year that. scheduled already. It's gonna be mm -hmm. good. <laughs> so we, we encourage you to not only see the exhibition here, uh, but to see Blue, Guys, Blue Sky Gallery. They have a beautiful library, the Northwest uh, photography drawers as well, the viewing drawers. Uh, so it's a, pro a program uh, that will, with, I hope, any luck, continue on for at least another 40 years. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things that was strange about coming into our new location that we own, our space and all this, is we had to change our headspace from the usual nonprofit thing of like, hey, look, it's another year and we're still around. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, you talk about dog years. Well, gallery years, I think, are even shorter than dog years. We, we, have, mm. we have some galleries that, that, that have gone on for a long time, but mostly galleries don't live that long. Um, actually, there's a Portland gallery that's closing this month. Um, but there's a, uh, uh, I think there's a, there's a, a richness to being able to go back into another art, to an artist who's doing really good work over and over again. This, this work of Sage, is we, we were interested in showing it back when it was new work, but she, we had already done two shows of hers in rapid succession, and it was like, we didn't want people to think, oh, yeah, it's the Sage Sawyer Gallery. You know, it's like, oh, we gotta spread it around <laughs> a little bit. Um, so it's really nice to come back and get it now. Uh, we, we ended up not having a, uh, a ballot measure, not needing a ballot measure to overturn our defense of marriage uh, uh, amendment, but we didn't know. We thought that might have been on the ballot, and we, we wanted to make sure that people had a chance to, to meet these scary gay people. <laughs> and Sage does a great job of that. It's, the work is really, um, if, you, if you think about having an opportunity to go into a space and every month there's two people saying, I wanna share something with you that I've been working on for years, that has been my main passion for the last three years or whatever. And that's pretty amazing. I mean, it's, it's like if, you, uh, if every night you got to go to dinner with somebody who's been working on this dinner for a week, you know? It, and that, that's, our, that's the sort of basis of our enthusiasm, you know? You, if you go see, uh, Stu, is ha Stu Levy's having a show next month at Ogden and it's gonna be, years of work, you know, that's mm -hmm. like he's been, here's something that I've been working on, I'm gonna share it with you, you know. And I think every show you go to, there's, there's beautiful shows all over town this month, actually it's a very good month this month. Um, and, uh, and if you're, I think for a lot of people, they're not used to going to galleries, they're used to coming to the museum, I mean, the numbers of people who come through the museum doors is 10 times the number of people who go to any galleries. And one of the things that I, that I hope this show can contribute is to have some of those 90% of your audience say, you know, this is really cool. Maybe I should start going to the galleries where, where there's an opportunity to see uh, a one-person show that's a whole body of work. And I have to say that, unfortunately, the art world right now, galleries are becoming less important and art fairs are becoming more important. And going to an art fair is sort of like going to Fred Meyer. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not... I mean, if you, if you see this show of Sages and, and here's all these pictures and, there's, and you, can, you can read interviews with these people, and I mean, you, you get to really understand what she's doing as opposed to if there was one of her pieces in her gallery's booth at an art fair, you don't get any sense of it. Or even, I mean, her one piece that's in, that's in your show, you get a sense of the gallery because here's a, here's, you know, a hundred pieces from the gallery, you get a sense of that, but you don't get as, as good a sense of what each individual photographer is doing as if you had been to those hundred shows. So I think there's a real place for, um, Blue Sky has always served to kind of put a microphone in front of the artist. And we, we don't really take the attitude that we're the, we're the curators and we know more than the artist does and don't show us that, that work, take this one out, this one's no good, this is no good, we're gonna tell you what you're doing. We're like, if the artist knows what they're doing, 
Um, let's put them in front of a microphone. Let's amplify their voice so that more people can hear it. Or more people can see what they're doing, but I'll use that metaphor of the microphone. And I think there's a, I mean, sometimes it's frustrating sometimes, because sometimes we'll see an artist who's got great work, but they clearly don't know what they're doing. And their great work is mixed in with the work that sh like, should not be in this group. And we just say, okay, well, when they figure out what they're doing, we're going to show them. You know? But we're not, we're here if it, to, to carry your voice. And if you don't know what you're saying yet, we're not ready for you. And with that, Mr. Rauschenberg, I would like to congratulate you and your team on 40 years of Blue Sky. Thank you. Congratulations.